Welcome, Good morning, friend. everybody. Goodness, great to be with you. And uh, would you thank these wonderful creatives for leading us in worship today? Amen. 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 Well, make yourself at home, if you would, please. Uh, and if you have a copy of the Bible, I'm going to ask you to open it up to Exodus chapter 20. So we're going to be reading from a, a section of the Bible that I, I think um, is going to be really important for you today. I had the privilege last evening of going to dinner with Pastor Terry and Judith. And if you haven't had the chance to see his beard up close... I just, I was sitting at the dinner table and I just wanted to caress it and just, <laughs> and take a nap at the table. It's just glorious. Thank you for your gift to this world. It is a gift. Gosh, what a joy to be together today. I'm from the Pacific Northwest. I live in Eugene, Oregon. Do we have any Oregonians in the room? Come on, come on. Got some Oregonians in the room. It has been a wild summer in Oregon as we had a lot of fires and whatnot, but uh, God has been faithful and, and loving and kind to all of us. And this morning, I, I want to talk about something that I have a suspicion maybe you haven't thought a whole lot about. I want to tell you a story. <clears throat> a few years ago, I was sitting in the backyard of a friend who was actually an admiral in the Navy. He'd spent his life as a, as a military professional. And <clears throat> he was telling me this phenomenon. He says, you know, when you look at World War II and Vietnam, they were two very different wars, but in one very particular way. When you look at these two wars, there was <clears throat> this, this experience after World War II. My, I have three grandfathers, one step-grandfather and two biological grandfathers, uh, that went and fought in, in, in the war. And when they came back, you know, the, the men who came back from the war, it was like, it was like evil had been defeated, right? Yeah. Hitler had been brought down. The Third Reich had been dismantled. I mean, it was, it was like evil had been faced. And when the men came back, they, they were just, it was just one of the greatest times in history. They talk about it before they all passed away. They told me how great that was. They had parades and everything. And they came back and they were super healthy, super low drug abuse rates. Abuse rates were uh, drug abuse and abuse spousal rates were really low. PTSD, super low. And they were just so happy after the war that they just came back and had a bunch of babies. They're called baby boomers. Right? It was a good time. It was a good time. And, and it, was, it was just like our, our nation, America, had, we, we, had, we, had, we had, you know, conquered this, this evil uh, being. But when you compare that to Vietnam, my friend was telling me, it was a very different experience. When the Vietnam veterans came back from World War II, more often than not, actually, sky, uh, drug abuse rates skyrocketed, uh, spousal abuse skyrocketed, PTSD, suicide, one of the worst heroin epidemics in American history. And you look at these two wars and you go, it was, what was different? And of course, war is always bad. We're not, it's not like there's one good war and one bad war, but when, what was the difference? And my friend said, who had spent 30 years as an admiral, he said, the Navy has one simple theory. And here's what it was. When the Vietnam War ended, the men literally got on planes and flew back and were home, often in their, you know, their living room within three days. But when you look at World War II, the men didn't fly home. What did they do? They got in boats. And what do you do on a boat? For two months, crossing the Atlantic, the Pacific Ocean, what did they do? For two months, they just cried. They told their story. They wept. They had space. They stopped. And the difference between these two, these two wars, my friend said, is that one of them had a chance to rest, but one didn't. Now, when I think about what is taking place in our culture right now, I don't know if there's a better metaphor, because honestly, we are at a time in history where nobody has a chance to just stop and rest and breathe and be with God and cry and process. How many of you have found a way to get on Twitter and not get depressed? <laughs> Anybody in the room? Not one hand up. I, I made them. I got on Facebook last week. I've been in counseling all week. I, I mean, it's just... It's, <laughs> Just so depressing. And here's my experience, right? You get on Twitter and you, you like learn about this injustice and this wrong, this thing that happened. And you're like, ah, I'm going to fight that. And then like before you know it, you're like, oh, wait, there's uh, this other crisis here that I've got to do something about. And then there's this injustice and this political thing and this. And before you know it, you're like, I can't do anything about any of this stuff. 
It's just more and more and more and more. I spent the last 10 years church planting in Portland, Oregon. I had the chance to be part of a team that started this awesome church in urban Portland before transitioning to being a full-time teacher. And one of the things about Portland, I love it. It's on the news all the time. But I love the city of Portland because justice matters in Portland. I value that. I value the city because the justice is really important. But one of the hard things about living in a place like Portland is how exhausting it is not knowing what stuff I'm supposed to be really mad about this week. It's like this justice exhaustion. You know, there's, there's all this stuff going on. For example, one-third of teenagers, every night one-third of teenagers stop sleeping, check their phones for social media, texting, TikTok, you name it, whatever. Wow. One-third of teenagers. We wonder why teenagers are committing suicide at such a high rate. They're not sleeping. They're not sleeping. We, we, we live in this, in this constant, never-ending world. We don't know how to stop. And what's ironic is we used to stop. There actually used to be these laws in America called blue laws. And you would, you would literally, everything would shut down on Sundays. You would go to church on Sunday mornings. You would go home with your family. Your parents would nap. Yeah. And you'd be so confused, like, why do you need to lock your door for a simple nap, you know? And you'd just be at home. I mean, you would be forced to just go home. And this was the law until the 1960s. We don't have any of that anymore. None of it. We are a 24-7, never-ending culture, and it's killing us. I'm 39 years old, and I can remember one day in my life where our nation paused. <laughs> September 11, 2001, <laughs> when those planes flew into those towers and into a field of Pennsylvania and into the Pentagon, and we were all forced to stop and call the people we loved. Yeah. It now requires a tragedy for us to stop. Yeah. I actually think we yearn for tragedy because we know it's going to give us a little break. We are exhausted. Can I ask you this morning, if you're honest with yourself and the people you love, are you tired? Yeah. And the, even the people that can't raise their hand, they're just too tired to do it. They're just like, <laughs> they can't even get their hand up. Here's the hope. I want to give you hope today. For, in the last 10 years, I have seen more people fall asleep in the middle of my sermon in church than at any other time in history. And, and it's not, I don't think it's because I'm a bad preacher. I think I'm all right. Okay, I think I'm okay. But, but, here's the hope. I think the church of Jesus should be the one place people can come and find rest. Let's talk about the Bible. Exodus 20. These are the Ten Commandments. So Moses, the, the story of the Ten Commandments, of course, comes that Moses has, has, has led Israel out of Egypt. God has led Israel out of Egypt, but Moses was their, their physical leader, and they, they come out. And, of course, you, you find this story. They've been brought out of slavery, but they come to this mount called Mount Sinai where they stay for one year. They worship this golden calf there. There's a whole story about that that we could talk about this morning. Uh, N.T. Wright, who's one of my favorite Bible scholars, says that, you know, it's not really hard for God to get Israel out of Egypt, but it's really hard for God to get Egypt out of Israel. Right? So he can bring you out, but we just love worshiping the old gods. They worship these, these golden calves. But before that happens, Moses goes up on this mountain, and he brings down these Ten Commandments. You know some of these, right? Commandment one, have no other God before me. Commandment two, don't make an idol for yourself. Commandment three, don't misuse God's name. Commandment four, I'll read this in a second, the Sabbath commandment. Commandment five, honor your mother and your father. Commandment six, don't murder. Don't you love that those two are next to each other? <laughs> right? like, <laughs> honor your parents, and that like means like don't kill them, right? That's like the first step in the love process. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't have sex outside of marriage. Don't, don't steal. Don't give false testimony. And don't, and don't be jealous. You look at these Ten Commandments. And of course, we skipped over the one. Listen to this. The Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. 
Six days do all your work. You shall do all your labor. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. And on it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor your daughter, nor your manservant, nor your maidservant, nor your animals, nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day, and God made it holy. Now I want you to see four things from this. Number one, do you notice God says keep it holy? And that's really important. When you go back to Genesis 1 and 2, when God created the world, there is actually only one thing that God calls holy. You know what it is? Not you. (laughs) You know what it is? The day of rest. Only one thing. Only one thing is called kadosh, and kadosh means to be set apart, to be different. It's not like any of the other days. It's a unique day. It's different. It's set aside from the rest. And God says, keep it holy. The point is, you don't make it holy. You just keep it holy. It's already holy. It's already holy. Number two, I want you to notice this. Did you notice that the Sabbath commandment isn't just for you? It's for everyone you love. Your your manservant, your maidservant, your kids. Did, Did you notice it was about your animals too? It is for everybody that you love. It's for your kids, your families, your workers, your employers. Have you ever thought about the fact that it's for your pets? Your animals, that little goldfish your six-year-old owns, they need a rest too. (laughs) And actually what I love about this commandment is it's about the rest of God is for creation. You know what's really interesting about COVID is it's actually, it's caused us to live differently. And it turns out that when we don't travel as much as we do, all the smog in LA starts disappearing. Did you know the rivers in Italy are like clearing up because we're not on them all the time. It's like Sabbath is for creation too. Not only that. Number three, but the Sabbath commandment is not just for the people you love. It's for the foreigner too. It's for the alien within your gates. Now I have a friend who's an undocumented worker and he said to me, before the process of, of, of being nationalized, becoming a citizen of their nation, he said, you know, when you're undocumented in this nation, He said, there's no rest. Because if you make one mistake and they pull you over, you're gone. He said, there's no rest. And when I look at this commandment, this is what I see. That the Sabbath matters even for the refugee. Even for the foreigner. Even for the person who isn't a part of your church. By the way, in the ancient world, do you know who loved to go to war with the Jews? Everyone. You know why? Because the Jews, catch this, were the only ancient religion that would not fight one day a week in a war. They would give their rest even to their enemies. Not powerful. And notice this, number four. This is the only commandment that begins with the word remember. Now God doesn't, it's interesting, God's word is true and, and right, and it's, it's, it's the way God made, he spoke this stuff the way he wants it to be. I find it fascinating that not one of the other commandments says remember. Like it doesn't say remember not to murder. You know, and you'll never meet somebody who's like, well, when I, when I murdered them, I just forgot about the Lord's. Like, we just know that one, right? We don't need to be reminded. It's like, well, yeah, that's like all people know that one. But you come to this one. This is the only one that starts with remember. And it's like God knew what he was talking about. Imagine that. I wonder if God knew that of the ten, this would be the one we would be most likely to forget. Remember it. Remember this. I want to tell you the darkest epiphany I've ever had. I was pastoring a church in Portland. Church planting is hard work. Can I get an amen from those in the room who've been here? Okay. It's hard work. About five years into planting this church in urban Portland, our church got really tired, naturally. And so I could tell that they were tired, and I said, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a sermon series. I'm going I'm to teach on the Sabbath, on rest, because that's, that's what pastors do when there's a problem in the church. We do a sermon series. 
So I'm like, okay, there's a problem. Let's do a series, and we'll, we'll call it good. So I'm like, okay, we're going to do four weeks on the Sabbath. I'm going to preach for four weeks on this idea of rest. And so I lay out the series, and we do the sermon series. Now I'm going to tell you, I have preached on a lot of things that have gotten me in trouble. I've preached on sexuality. I've preached on marriage. I've preached on polyamory. I preached a whole sermon against weed once. <laughs> I've preached on some stuff that didn't get me, get me into the Hall of Fame of some people's lives. <laughs> and I want you to hear this. I preached for four weeks on Sabbath rest, and I don't think we have ever had more people leave the church. Wow. And what I found was this. The Sabbath idea is entirely offensive to everything we think of what it means to be an American. Affluence, productivity, busyness, it steps on all of our idols. I was in an elder meeting after that four-week sermon series. The elders wanted to hear from me why we were, do we were ever doing this stuff. And I had an epiphany that as a pastor, if I break like nine of these commandments, I'll lose my job. If I commit adultery, I'll probably lose my job. If I start preaching another gospel, I'll probably lose my job. But if I don't take a day of rest, if I, if I, don't, if I commit murder, I'll definitely lose my job. <laughs> but if I don't take a day of rest, I'll probably get a raise. It is the one commandment we literally incentivize people to break. We don't believe in the Ten Commandments. We believe in nine commandments and one strong suggestion. And my question is, why do we think we know better than God? Why? Where did this idea come from that God doesn't know best? You know, the problem is, usually we're better at cliches than we are the Bible. You know, the number of times I've heard well-intentioned Christians or pastors say, you know, <laughs> I don't need to rest because the devil never rests. <laughs> yeah, to which I would say, that's like, why he's the devil? <laughs> And, and by the way, just what a weird discipleship paradigm. Let's see what Satan's doing and do that. Yeah? The, the irony in the Bible, I should point out, by the way, is that God knows how to rest, but the devil doesn't. When Jesus uh, is, casts out a demon and he says the spirits go through arid places looking for a place to rest, uh, in Revelation 14, uh, 11, it says that those that worship the beast will neither rest day nor night. The irony of the Bible is that God knows how to rest, but the demonic does not. Yeah. Isn't that ironic? That the mark of God is that he's not, he's not busy, but we're, be we're better at cliche than we are at the Bible. Now, I know there's going to be somebody in the room who's going to go, okay, so the Sabbath, it's in the Ten Commandments, but that's just law. Doesn't that go along with the whole don't eat bacon thing? <laughs> I know there's someone in the room who's like, oh, they're just trying to bring back Jewish legalism and all this stuff. And I, listen, okay, okay, I hear your point, but here's the problem. Sabbath is in the law, but guess what? It comes before the law, too. You go back to the very beginning of the Bible. And when God created Adam and Eve, what did he do? He put them in a garden. And he said to Adam and Eve, take care of the garden. In fact, in Hebrew, the word take care of is the same Hebrew word as to worship. The implication is to worship God is actually to care, take care of his garden. That's, I don't think there's any more important commitment about taking care of the planet than that one for Christians. To care for the planet is actually a mark of loving the gardener who is God. Right? So he takes Adam and Eve, and he puts them in the garden, and he says, you guys are going to work, and you're going to have a job. You're going to name the animals. You're going to grow the corn. You're going to be in the garden. It's going to be phenomenal. But here's the deal, God says. One day a week, you're going to stop and be with me. One day a week. 
Now, I'm a Bible professor, so what part of my job is to help people see the Bible in its context. And friends, when you read the Bible in its original context, you, you got to understand, the Jews who wrote these stories are not the only people in the ancient world who had a creation story. The Akkadians had ones, the Babylonians, the Egyptians, all these other religions had creation stories too. And when you read the creation story in the Bible and you compare it to the creation stories in all the ancient religions, all of a sudden you begin to see that God in the Bible is totally different than anybody else. There's three things that the Bible does that no other religion does. Number one, the creation story in the Bible is the only one in which everything God makes is good. Did you notice he can't make anything without calling it good? He's just like, he makes it. Like, that was awesome. It's like, oh, did you see what I just made? That was incredible. Everything he makes is good. Tov, 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 Hebrew, tov, tov, good, 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 good. Because God only makes good stuff. You know, I, somebody took me, so friends of mine uh, took me to uh, tacos yesterday. And I, I'm sitting there eating these tacos. And have you ever had a moment where you're eating something and, I mean, have you ever had a mango? And you're eating it and... Uh, a real mango. Like, I'm talking a real mango. A mango that's like, you've ripped the skin off and it's just, it, the juice just float. You have to shower afterwards. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, right? And that mango right there, I have never met somebody who, after eating one of those mangoes, was like, yeah, I'm an atheist. Because <laughs> you can't eat that stuff and say there's no God. You can't. In fact, that's all I do for my atheist friends. I just take them mangoes, and I'm like, taste and see that the Lord is good. He loves you. <laughs> and that's exactly, literally what Paul says in the book of Romans. He says the invisible qualities of God have been written in creation. His point is that when God made mangoes, they're love letters to us. Yeah. Creation is good. Yeah. Do we pervert it? All the time we do, but creation is good. Yeah. Second thing. The creation story in the Bible is the only ancient religion that says women are made in the image of God. No other religion said that. Honestly, I mean, not only that God, you look at all the other religions, women are mistakes, they're footnotes, they're, they're gross, they're wrong, there's something bad with them. You look at this story, and God says about women, not only did God make them, they bear God's image in this world. I don't know, if I have any of my progressive or conservative friends in this room who think this book is anti-women, you haven't read the thing. From page one on. So much so, by the way, that when Jesus dies, resurrects from the grave, it is the male disciples who are in a room terrified while the women go to the tomb. <laughs> See it's empty. Go back and preach the first Easter sermon. He is risen. Can women preach? We wouldn't know the gospel without the women. So the whole thing, God created women. And then the third thing is, friends, there's no religion in the ancient world that said, God gives us a day of rest, except for this one. Like When God created the world, he said, I didn't make you to be workaholics. I made you to have a day to stop and be with me and eat a mango. I mean, we, we should be dancing in the aisles. Come on, yeah. Friends, we literally worship the God who invented the weekend. Yeah. Can I point out to you, super nerdy Bible point, but can I point out to you, what day were Adam and Eve made? Day six. What day was the day of rest? Day seven. What did Adam and Eve do on their very first day of existence? They rested. And the idea of God is that we begin with the rest and then get to work. And actually that is, you put a gun to my head, the first image of the gospel in the Bible. Some of you believe in a message that says, 
Listen, if I, some of you believe, if I can get the work done, if I can repent, if I can stop, if I can go to church, if I can stop looking at porn, if I can stop cussing, if I could stop sleeping around, if I could stop drinking too much, then God will love me. And I got to tell you, friends, that's not good news. That's fake good news. Good news is before you did a lick of repentance while you were an enemy of God, Jesus died on the cross for you. You don't work to get the rest. You rest and then get the work done. Is there work? Oh, there's work. Oh, there's work. Some of the millennials in the room need to be told. Oh, there's work. Oh, there's work. But the work does not bring God's goodness and grace. It is the result of it. Are you with me? Yeah. Praise the Lord. You know, my, my son, my son is nine years old, little Elliot. He is the coolest guy you'll ever meet. Okay, I wish he could be with me today. When he was in my wife's womb for nine months, you know what he did for nine months? I'll tell you what he did. He didn't work. <laughs> he just kind of kicked around. He had, like in a, he had like a tube going to his belly. He didn't even have to eat. He's just like, oh, <laughs> like, like, I am here. It's heaven. I mean, he just, that's all I did for nine months. He's been out in the world for nine years. You know what he's been doing for nine years? Not working. (laughs) He's been playing Legos and eating my food for nine years. And I just think it is God's design that we start with the Legos and we start with the rest and then get to work. It's the gospel. It's the gospel. I want to tell you how my family does this. By the way, does this sound like something you need? I want to tell you how our family does it. So on Friday evening, I come home. We Sabbath on Saturdays. And by the way, does it matter what day it is? Paul says explicitly, some people think it's one day, others another, but what you do, do it unto the Lord. The day is not what matters. The matter that what matters is that you are working to enter his rest. That's what matters. It's not about the day. But what we do on Friday night is I come home. The first thing I do is this. I take this little device. How many of you have one of these things? Lord have mercy. This is literally what we do. This is our life right now. I was just at the airport. This is what we all do now. We're just like... All the time. That's all. And have you noticed even old people, they're just slower. They're just like... So here's what I do. I come over on Friday. I come home on Friday, and the first thing I do is I turn it off. I don't know if you know this, but you can turn it off. <laughs> and it's, it's tricky, because the people who invented this little thing made it so that when you turn it off, it flashes a little apple with a bite taken out of it. <laughs> like you're back in the Garden of Eden, and you've been eating from the wrong tree all week long. Yeah, 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 yeah. Other story. Anyways, moving on. <clears throat> I turn it off. And here's why. Because I think not only your body needs rest, I think your mind needs rest. And I think your friends need a rest from you. And I think your enemies need a rest from you. (laughs) So I turn it off. And I come home. And you know what we do? We have a big meal. We eat this huge meal. And we sing this song. It's an old Jewish song. We light a Sabbath candle. Sabbath means stop, rest, cease. We light a Sabbath candle and we sing this song. It's an old Jewish song. And it goes, Shabbat Shalom to AJ. Shabbat Shalom to Quinn. Shabbat Shalom to Elliot. And my son always, like, adds something. He's like, because we have chicken. So he's like, Shabbat Shalom to the chicken. <laughs> so it's the cutest thing. And we go to bed. We just have this meal. And we wake up in the morning. My son runs into my room. And he gets right into my face. And he goes, he goes, he goes, Papa. Papa. It's the Sabbath. <laughs> so I, and I wake up. And we go out into the kitchen and we put the bacon in the, in the oven and we start the coffee going. And, and my son and I, we s- stand in the kitchen together and we make the biggest pancakes you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm going to tell you this. There's a generation of pastor's kids, of PKs, that hate the church because they see the church as having stolen their parents from them. 
And I'm going to tell you right now, the Sabbath ain't just about you. It's about your kids. It's about your parents. And we make these pancakes. And my son, he pours maple syrup on this thing. And here's what we do. This is why we do it. We do it because there's this old ancient Jewish tradition that on the morning of the Sabbath, the father was to get up before any of the kids and to give them all a spoon of honey so that the kids would never forget the sweetness of God's rest. And we sit there, baby, and the bacon and the pancakes. It is the closest thing to Eden I've ever seen. A little bit later on in the day, my son watches a movie. I take a nap. (laughs) On a very rare occasion, two naps, but it's, it's normally just one. And you know what we do? Here's what we do. For one day, we stop producing and we just exist in God's presence. And I want to tell you right now, God is always making pancakes. Do you smell them? Are you hungry? Your kids are. Your parents are. You are. What if we smell that and we enter back into God's call to remember what God loves and have a day a week where we could stop and just be with God? Can I get an amen? Okay. 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 Would you stand with me, please? I want to close with this. I want to close with this. Jesus said something really interesting. He said, for those of you that are tired, I'll give you rest. And what I think Jesus meant when he said that is he's not just saying I'm going to give you a day of rest. I think what he's saying is your soul is tired. Your mind is tired. Your spirit is tired. And today, Jesus comes for the weary. All you got to do is believe. Do you believe? Do you believe? Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we conclude our time of hearing from God's Word, as we've been confronted by something you love, those words of Jesus, if you're tired, I will give you rest, are as true today as they were 2,000 years ago. They are as true today as they were in the Garden of Eden, and they are as true today as they were in the Ten Commandments, that God, you are the God of Sabbath rest. God, praise. I love God that we only, no one ever says people, people, no one ever says, God, about you, that you work like, the, that people work like the Messiah. We always say people work like the devil. I love that when we're with you, Messiah, we find rest. You're a restful God. So we believe, would you give us rest to our souls? Rest to our minds, rest to our bodies. If you need that and you receive the rest of Jesus, raise your hands and do so with power today. Say, Jesus, I receive your rest and mercy and love. I receive your grace and mercy, and I enter into the love and mercy that is in Jesus. Amen and amen. All of God's people, would you say amen with me today? Amen. Praise the Lord.